Hello, man. Welcome back. Thanks for joining me today as we continue to have a conversation about being the man that God wants us to be. So in this session today, we're going to be reading from the Exemplary Husband book by Stuart Scott. We're going to be picking up where we left off last time on page 32. Page 32. So this is in chapter 3 um, on page 32, starting off at the heading that says God's view of man. God's view of man. I just happen to believe that we need a reminder um, on what, what God's view of man is. How does God view us? Um, that's so important that we have. So last time, last time when we were in this book, uh, we were talking about the, the false views of man. What are the false views that we have of who who men are, uh, man in general, as far but but who we are as God's creation? But now uh, this book is going to be going into what is God's view of His creation, God's view of man. And so, um, thank you for so much for joining me. I'm thankful that uh, you took to the time to uh, watch this session and to continue to grow. Um, something that God desires for us as men is to continue to grow. Grow in our thought processes, uh, grow in our heart, and grow in the love that's coming out of our mouth and our actions. Uh, to the people around us. Um, first, the closest people to us. If you're married, God, man, God wants you to have love just pouring out of your mouth and your actions towards your wife. He, if you have kids, he wants love to be pouring out of your mouth and your actions towards your children. Um, and then, and then, and then more, right? Those who are outside your household, in your church family, in your community. And so that's, that's who God is calling us to be as real men. So let's jump into the book, God's View of Man. Every man desiring to know God and be the husband he should be must reject false views about man and adopt God's view. In the first chapter of Genesis, God has revealed the truth about our beginning. So here's number one, the first God's view of man. Number one, man was created by God. Man was created by God. The first thing we must believe is that God is the creator and man is his creation. Genesis 1.27 says, And God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. There are at least three things we can learn from God's creation of us. The most basic thing we need to grasp is that we are not our own we are neither in control nor independent. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. Secondly, we need to understand that there is a great distinction between God, who is our creator, and us, who are his creatures. Even though we are an amazing work of God that is unique from the rest of creation, we are still merely a creation made by one who is far greater. Psalm 113, 4 through 6 says, The Lord is high above all nations. His glory is above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God? Who is enthroned on high? Who humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in earth? Thirdly, we need to be aware that life does not revolve around us. As our creator, God is the cause and center of all things. He is the rightful focus. He is the only one worthy of all glory. So number two, the number two in this book of God's view of man is this. Man was created for God. Man was, so number one was man was created by God. Number two is man was created for God. The fact that God created man in his own image gives us a hint as to why we were created. We were created for him. Colossians 1.16, the end of it says, All things have been created by him and for him. 
This truth may be quite a shock to the one who believes his purpose here is to get all I can out of life. It may even be a surprise to professing Christians who live as though God is there for them rather than the other way around. But the one who views God and himself rightly counts it a privilege to exist for him, to, to worship him. We were created for God that we might receive the worship he deserves. God is entirely holy, powerful, and true. He, therefore, fully deserves our focus, adoration, praise, and honor. He is worthy of our worship, and he rightfully expects it. First, Chron First Chronicles 29.11 says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the victory and the majesty, indeed everything that is in the heavens and the earth. Yours is the dominion, O Lord, and you, and you exalt yourself as head over all. Every human being is born with a debt of worship to God. Not one of us has paid that debt fully. Some people are oblivious to their need to acknowledge the Creator. Others willfully refuse to worship Him. It is amazing that God patiently waits for the right time to judge mankind for its lack of worship. We must ask ourselves if we have embraced this first purpose for which we were created, to worship God. Is the central activity of your life to worship God? The Father is seeking worshipers. John 4.23 says, But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers, to be a people of his very own. We were also created for God so that he might have a people. The primary meaning of the word holy in the Bible often involves the idea of separation or of being cut off from something. It is frequently used in the Old Testament of, of people or things being set apart as holy to the Lord. Something that is set apart for the Lord is specially marked as his possession and is reserved for his righteous, purpose, <laughs> his righteous purposes and use. In the beginning, man was set apart for him with a specific purpose in view. God was going to have a people of his very own. Psalm 100, 100 verse 3 says, Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. God has stooped very low to even concern himself with us. Even so, he has revealed his desire to walk with man throughout history. As early as the Garden of Eden, God walked with man. He continually called the nation of Israel to abide in a relationship with himself. Through Christ, God is still calling people to walk with him today. Titus 2.14 says, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people that are his very own. To put his character on display or glorify him. Through our creation, God not only could receive the worship he deserves and have a people of his very own, but he could also be glorified in an awesome way. By creating us, loving us, working among us, and showering us with grace, God's character has been on display. He has been on display before the angels in heaven, man, and even Satan and the demons. Psalm 66, 5 says, Come and see the works of God, who is awesome in his deeds toward the sons of men. Those who have been forgiven of their sins can join God in an awesome display of his character by acknowledging him, by proclaiming his great deeds, and by making disciples. Even those who rebel against God will have a part in putting God's character on display. His justice will be seen by all. Throughout history, man has turned away from God's purpose and has chosen a selfish and sinful way. Many seek the pleasures of this life. Others seek God for their own ends. The truth is, 
Our greatest purpose in life is God's pleasure. So number three, God's view of man is this. Man is God's enemy by nature. Man is God's enemy by nature. As much as God desires to receive our worship and have an abiding relationship with us, he cannot and will not unjustly ignore the great barrier that our sin has created between himself and us. Isaiah 59.2 says, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear you. We may not ever feel like God's enemy, but by the simple fact that we inherit the sinful nature of Adam, we are his enemies from birth. Our sinful condition is seen in both our failure to worship God as he deserves and in our bent towards sin and selfishness. But God did not leave us in this hopeless situation. We need not remain the enemies of God. Colossians 1, 21-22 says, And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death, in order to present you before him, holy and blameless and beyond reproach. So far we have learned that man is sinful to the core, dead in his trespasses and sins, an enemy of God, fully responsible and unable to meet God's standard or to help himself. Man was born with a debt of worship to his creator, but instead has worshipped and served himself, even in his good deeds. He is bound to the lustful, selfish, and sinful desires of his flesh, and is deceived by his sin-stained mind and foolish heart. Even though man is restrained from full expression of his sinfulness, he is doomed, apart from God's direct intervention on his behalf, to suffer the consequences of his own sin and rebellion by spending an eternity in hell, paying for his sins against a holy God. What an ugly picture of ourselves. But God in his mercy is willing to make you into a different picture, a different man. Men, we're going to go ahead and stop right there uh, as far as the reading uh, in the book today. I think that's, uh, that's enough to, to, to chew on right now. But think of these, uh, these, two, uh, these three view of, of men uh, from God's perspective. Uh, number one was man was created by God. Number two was man was created for God. And number three is, man is God's enemy by nature. Man is God's enemy by nature. So, you, <laughs> let's, let's personalize this. I, you, were created by God. You did not create yourself. You did not carve yourself out of a rock. You did not, you did not form yourself out of the mud of the earth. But there's a God in heaven who made you. That leads us to the fact that there's a God in heaven who made you for him. He made you for him. He didn't make you for yourself. He didn't make you for other people, but he made you for him. That gives us that. So not only do we know the author of our life, God, the father in heaven, not only do we know the author, um, but we know the purpose for our life. We were made for God in heaven. And then thirdly, man. This is bad news, but man is God's enemy by nature. Because of sinful nature, we are, by nature, we are God's enemy. But here's the good news. In his mercy, God is willing. He was willing and he is willing. And as long as you're alive, he will be willing to make you into a different picture. So men, let me ask you, where are you at today? Is God making you into a different picture of who you once were? We, on our own, are bound. This book is saying we're bound to lustful, selfish, and sinful desires 
that come from our own self. Scripture tells us that it's out of the heart that come lustful thoughts. It's out of the heart that come adulteries. It's out of the heart that comes uh, wickedness and, and, and all these bad things. It's out of the heart. That's what Jesus says. But we're not stuck in this. There's a God in heaven who made us and he made us for him and he wants to bring us out of that and make us into a different picture. And so I, I'm simply asking you the question, are you allowing God to make you into a different picture? Would you be willing to have a conversation with God today? Wherever you're at, maybe you've never had this conversation with God before. Maybe you are in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Wherever you're at, would you be willing to ask him once again today, Father in heaven, I want you to make me into a different picture. Would you, uh, either for the first time asking him, would you make me into a different picture or would you continue that process? Because we're all in process. Um, we're all uh, needing to continue to be in process until the Lord returns or we die and go to meet him. But he wants to continue to chisel off the rough areas. He wants to continue to mold you and make you into the man of God that he desires you to be. So would you join, join me in prayer right now? Would you join me in prayer? Let's ask him to make us into the men of God that he wants you to be. Maybe the, it, this is hitting home with you as a husband right now. Maybe this is hitting home as, as the father. Uh, um, I had an inter interaction with my son uh, a week and a half ago that, I, man, I felt bad about it. I, I had the most intense conversation that I've ever had with my son. Um, I, I, I didn't need to be as harsh as I was, um, but I was. And, and um, but you know what? Good things, because I, I, I quickly asked my son to forgive me, and, and then I asked uh, God to forgive me for some harsh harshness, um, but then I asked God to redeem it, and I've seen how God is redeeming it. God can redeem the things in our life that we have erred in, but we've got to offer it to him. We've got to ask for his help. So would you go with me to prayer? Father, thank you. Thank you that you have made us. Thank you that you've made us to be for you. You made us for you. And thank you that you don't live, uh, that you don't keep us in a sin nature, but you bring us out of a sin nature and that you're wanting to make us into a different picture of, uh, of, of me, you're, of, of the people that, the men who are watching this video. Would you make me, would you make us into the different picture that you want us to be? Make us into your portrait, not to, into the self-made portrait that we desire, but would you replace our desires with your desires and make us into make me into the man of God that you want me to be? Father, I desire to be your man. I desire to pursue after the things that you want me to pursue after. Father, would you continue to work on our hearts and make us into the real men of God that you want us to be? Thank you for teaching us. Help us to be have ears to hear your voice. Help us to have eyes to see where you're working and help our hearts. Give us hearts to understand. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Men, uh, let me know how I can be praying for you. Um, feel free to e use the email or the number below. And um, thankful for watching this. Thank you for watching this video. I'll, I'll see you next time.